In this short video, we're going to be using XFLR5 to make a computation of um, the flow field on a Cessna 182. Uh, this is for a homework question in class, and we're going to be doing this by hand in, in, in class and as part of your homework, and we're going to also be doing this using computation. So the data is over here. It's a Cessna 182 plane shown here in sort of plan form. Uh, the wings on this are have a span, full span of 11 meters, total plan form area 16.2 meters, and the wings are made of um, two sections. You can see this, it's hard to see, but there's a straight section of constant cord that goes about half the width of the span, half the span, and then there's a tapered section on the end of that. Now for the class example in this problem here, we're going to assume a simpler wing that just has a root tapered down to a tip, so single section wing. Um, and so the root cord is 1.61 meters and the tip cord is 1.33 meters, which is a taper ratio of about 0 0.82. Both foils, or the entire wing, is made of the same NACA 2412 foil. And some of the aircraft um, data is up here. The mass of the total aircraft at takeoff, the speed 75 meters per second. Um, and at this altitude, you have these fluid properties. The density is about a kilogram per meter cubed and the kinematic viscosity is uh, about 20% higher than it is at sea level. And we can compute the entire um, three things really we need for this exercise is to know first um, what is the lift coefficient of the plane. And so the lift coefficient of the plane is the amount of lift it needs to generate, which is the mass of the plane times gravity. So we assume it's in steady flight, and we assume the main wing is supporting the entire plane. And so we normalize this by the kinematic um, um, by the uh, dynamic pressure, Q, and times the plan form area, S, and we get a lift coefficient of 0 0.303. Um, that is the whole plane lift coefficient. Now, the individual wing sections may vary from this lift coefficient. They're not going to vary strongly, and we'll see what that is based on um, the prediction of the software. Um, but but we, um, so we need to know this plane lift coefficient. We also have two Reynolds numbers, uh, the range of Reynolds numbers, the tip, which is the smallest, because the cord is smaller. Um, so it's a cord times the flight speed divided by the kinematic viscosity is about 6 million, a little bit less. And the root cord is about 7 million. Now, um, now I'll start XFL R5. Start it up. There it goes. OK, and now the first thing I need to do um, is get polars, essentially the performance polars for the foils of interest. In this problem, we only have one foil of interest, which is the NACA 2412. So I'm going to do an X-foil direct analysis of the NACA 2412. Now, you can import foils into XFLR5 just as we did into X-foil in previous class um, examples. But um, XFLR5, just as XFOIL does, has, has a built-in ability to do NACA foils internally. And I'm going to do that with design NACA foils. Select my NACA foil. It's a four-digit 2412 with 150 panels. Oops, 150 panels. Hit OK. And I'm going to save it in here. I'm going to save as a NACA 2412. That's sufficient. You can see that shows up in the menu here. There's only one foil. So I click the menu. I only get one foil. And some data down here about the geometry characteristics. Now I'm going to build the 3D wing. Um, actually, not quite yet. First, I'm going to get the performance polar polar for this um, particular aircraft. Um, uh, sorry, foil section 2412. And so I'm going to do analysis, a batch analysis. Now, what I'm going to need in my performance polar is the drag um, and lift, the drag and lift that that airfoil um, generates at a range of angles of attack and Reynolds numbers. Now what XFLR5 does is it's an inviscid solver. It solves for the flow over a 3D wing um, using an inviscid method, a boundary maze method. And for each of the sections, we'll be predicting a lift coefficient, a local lift coefficient for each of the sections. And what it wants to know to get the total drag, so the induced drag it will be computing itself, it also needs to know the, the profile drag, so that's the skin friction and the viscous pressure drag. And so given the lift coefficient of the, the local section and the Reynolds number of that local section, it will then go to its X-foil based polar and say, okay, 
for a 2412 at CL equals say 0.32 and a Reynolds of something like 6 million, um, what is the drag coefficient? And from its polar, it'll extract that drag coefficient and add it into its total drag for each of the sections. Um, so your, your polar data has to encompass the entire range of possibilities that it'll be looking up, otherwise you'll get an error. It, it doesn't extrapolate, it will only interpolate. Um, so I have a range of Reynolds numbers already put in here, 4 million to 8 million. Um, actually, let me go back, let me close this. So I'm gonna do a batch analysis. Um, now you can select a list of foils. You could load 10 foils initially and do a batch analysis on all 10 foils. We only have the 2412. We will do a batch analysis on a multiple foils in a separate video. A type one allows me to put in a range of Reynolds numbers and a range of either alpha or CL for my polars. And so I'm gonna stick with a type one, that's the type one analysis. My Reynolds range here I think is gonna be sufficient. So I have four million to eight million. And my, again, if I go over here, my, my tip was 5.75 and my root was 694. So that's in between. So this Reynolds encompasses my entire potential range of Reynolds numbers for the wing. Um, along you know, for the shortest chord to the largest chord, I'll do it in increments of 500,000. That seems reasonable and a Mach number of zero is incompressible. And end crit has to do with the free stream turbulence level and nine is sufficient for atmospheric problems. If you're doing hydrodynamics, uh, hydrofoils, you generally have a lower number, but we are doing flight, so we use nine. Now you can force transition. I can say I want the flow to trip at 30% of the chord, in which case I would put point threes in here. Um, you can force transition if you knew the transition location. Um, better than you think X-Foil could predict it, then you might force it at a certain point. If you let, want to let X-Foil take over and, and handle transition, which we were going to, then put your trips at the end of the foil. And so um, X-Foil, if it chooses to trip earlier than the end, then, uh, then so be it. And so we have a range of rentals, and now we want a range of angles of attack. Um, and so we could do this ranging CL. I'm going to choose to do it ranging alpha because it makes for a little bit nicer plot. And, um, but either way would work out as long as I'm encompassing the total possible range of Reynolds and lift coefficients that are going to come up. Um, they're going to be queried by XFL R5 itself. Now the range of lift coefficients has to be such that um, generally speaking the lift coefficients don't vary much from the whole wing lift coefficient, which again is 0 0.3. So I'm expecting my lift coefficient, my local lift coefficient range along the wing. So I think about my local lift coefficients, how are each of these little sections doing? Um, they are all gonna be around this number. And so we'll look later what the distribution is. Some might be say, 50, not 50%, say 25% higher and some are gonna be lower near the tip where it tends towards zero. Uh, but nothing's gonna be drastically different from that. So I'm going to pick a nice range of alphas so that I'm pretty much encompassing, uh, encompassing the entire potential uh, performance range of the wing from negative angles of attack or going to be negative lift all the way up to stall or pass stall. So, um, and then 100, this is the usual number that we, we is iter, I-T-E-R and X-foil that set, um, sets the number of um, coupled uh, iterations between the viscous solver and the boundary layer solver, I should say, and, and the potential flow solver. Um, make sure I got everything here. Okay, four million, eight million, this looks reasonable. So now I'm gonna hit analyze. It's running. So it's running a whole bunch of alphas, and a whole bunch of other alphas at different Reynolds number, a whole bunch of alphas at another Reynolds number, a whole bunch of alphas at another Reynolds number, etc. So. The curves are building. I can maybe see which one it's doing. So it's doing higher and higher. No, actually, let me see. Yep, it's doing higher and higher Reynolds numbers. So it's increasing the Reynolds number. I think it's almost done. And when it's done, we'll have a look at it. Um, so you can see you're getting some errors of unconvergence, which is kind of odd here. So there's sections, occasionally X-Foil misfires, like here you can see unconverged after 100 iterations. So whatever this Reynolds number is, uh, maybe we can figure that out. So that was 8 million. That was the highest Reynolds we put in there, Mach 0. It ran the string of alphas and it failed to converge one of those alphas. Now if in fact um, this coincides with the lift coefficient that's needed by XFL 
R5 at a Reynolds number of 8 million, which is not going to come up in this case, but let's say it did, it would just interpolate between these. So a failure here is fine. These later failures tend to be, um, you'll see some of these will tend to stop converging, and that's simply, uh, uh, it's getting beyond the stall limit. So, and we're not going to be in that range anyway. All right, so that's done. Close that. And it puts up these nice kind of polars. Uh, over here, you can see the color range. The 4 million is this kind of dark uh, sand, how I call it. Uh, that pinkish color is about 6 million. And that lighter, I'm not sure what I call it, light blue, I guess, is 8 million. And you can see our typical plot here. We have the lift um, all, uh, so that's a range of Reynolds numbers from 4 to 8 million by 500,000. And that in the linear part of the lift curve, and this is 2D, the linear, linear part of the lift curve is almost identical, right? They're on top of each other. And then they start to separate, and then the higher Reynolds number go, can get to a higher lift coefficient um, at this higher angle of attack before you start having um, a decrease in lift coefficient. I won't go through all these because we've talked a lot about 2D sections, but you can see here's our typical CLCD X-foil plot and transition plot um, and, and the moment curve here, which is generally plotted in traditional X-foil on top of the CL alpha curve. Um, so that's performance data is done, and now, um, and you can, if you want, plot just one of these. You can go pick this, and you go polars, and there's current polar, show only certain operating points. So you can kind of filter down if you have too much data. Look at all these angles of attack. If you have too much data, you can kind of filter down. Um, but in this case, we're not really interested in investigating the polars. We're going to move on to the 3D part. So we're going to build a 3D wing. So the next step is file. Um, wing and plane design. So we want to build a plane. And um, so I say plane, define a new plane. Okay, so define a new plane. Uh, let's call it Cessna 182. I don't really have to name it anything particular, but I'm going to. Um, and now you can build in XFL R5. Um, you can build a biplane, which I've never done, but you can build um, you can include a body in there. There's a big warning about not including a body, but if you look on the web, you'll see videos of people including bodies. We're not going to do that. We're not making a biplane, and we're actually going to ignore the tail altogether. So we're only doing a main wing. So I deactivated these components here, or at least fin and elevator were deactivated by me. Um, and now, so I'm only keeping the main wing, and now I'm going to define what that is. So it goes into the define menu, wing define menu. And you can see it plotting here as you begin to build it out. It starts with some default section. It's a one meter span, half span. So you're only, we're assuming it's a symmetric wing. Um, so we're going to define only one side of the wing, um, in this case the right side. So I'm going to have y plus uh, positive y values here for my span. You can put in as many sections as you want. So if we really wanted to build the true Cessna wing, this one, we'd have to put one section out of constant cord here and then taper another section. So I would have three data entries here. I'd have the root, I would have that transition point where transitions from straight to tapered, and then I'd have the tip. Um, and then I would define the wing that way. Now we're using a simpler case here. I'm going to do a two, uh, sorry, a one section which requires just the root and the tip. Now I'll start with the y value. So it's the um, span is five, uh, 11 meters, so I'm going to have a half span of five and a half. Um, my cord at the root was, I'm going to check what it was, 161 and 133. So I have 1.61 meters here. I have 1.33 meters here. All right, and I'm going to zoom out um, to see my wing, and you can kind of rotate it around. Now, it has no section shape now. I'm not sure what it's even trying to show there, a flat wing, I think. So I'm going to pick my foil here. If I had processed multiple foils, I could choose different foils other than the 2412, or you can even start with a 2412 and use with, end with a thinner foil, like a 2410. You might think about doing that. Um, here, we're trying to mimic the actual wing as it is in reality, so that's 2412. Um, you have some other options here. Now, if I look at this wing from the top, um, the, the x direction is the flow direction. So the, this is the leading edge here. And this is the trailing edge here. And you can see the leading edge is straight. And the reason it's straight is because, well, it's not quite straight. If I make this 0, it'll be exactly straight. And that is the offset. That's how far. So the 0 is always the coordinate of the um, leading edge of any of these sections. 
But if I offset a section by some amount, let me just use an extreme example to show you. If I put five in here, you can see what happens. So it, it offsets the, the tip chords way back. And of course, it's making it symmetrical. But I just basically set the x value of the leading edge of the tip chord to five meters. Um, and you can see it makes this sort of V-wing thing here. Let me put it back to zero. What I would like to do, I think, in this simple case is let's keep the mid-chord, let's put the mid-chord position on a straight line. So the mid-chord of the root is at 1.61 over 2, which is at basically 0.8 meters. So 0.8 meters is here, and I would like the mid-chord of this thing um, to be at 0.8 meters. So i got to do a little math here. Um, so the middle of that, uh, the middle of the, the tip is at um, 0.6665, and I want that to occur at 0.8, so I do 0.8 minus this. So I need an offset of 0.133. Okay, so that basically, if you look from the top, you get a wing that's um, tapered, and the mid chord is a straight line. So the middle of this section and the middle of this section is lined up in a straight line. Um, you can also put in here dihedral. Um, which we won't talk, this is a, for, for stability, so you, let's put a little bit in here and make it look more like a, oops, oh, okay, and should I specify, I shouldn't, I should be clear here. So the dihedral is specified at the beginning of the next section, so we only have one section, so the beginning of that is the root, so I put in some dihedral, looks like this, more like a bird, which have dihedral, um, like a seagull, I guess, so we're, we're not going to put dihedral, and the actual wing has a few degrees of dihedral, um, and again, that's a stability thing which we won't be discussing in class, but we're going to keep it zero um, to simplify things. And you can also twist each section, we only have one section. And twist is applied to the end uh, of the section. So the root stays still. I'll put some extreme twist in here. I'll put minus 15 degrees and you'll see it twist. There it goes. So it only twists the end and it's linearly interpolating between those. So if we look from the side, oops, sorry you can see that um, the tips are what are called washed out. They're turned down. The root cord is here. This is the leading edge to the left, leading edge near the origin. Um, this is the tip section, and it's turned down. I put in a negative angle of attack, of negative, negative twist angle, and it's washed out. Um, and washing out some advantages we'll discuss a little bit in class having to do with stall characteristics. It might also, when you go to do your projects, give you some advantage in terms of um, minimizing induced drag. We are going to put zero in this case. We're going to mimic the actual wing, which has zero washout. Um, and, and there we go. So that's our wing section. Now the other thing we want to do is change the paneling. Just as we do an X-foil, where we change the number of points along the section, we can also change the paneling here. Over here, I can click Panels, um, and this menu, Panels, and you can see the panels, and essentially it's discretizing this vortex, vortex uh, lattice method on each of these, in, um, in the center of each of these little square panels, rectangular panels. You can see its default clustering is such that it clusters more towards the tips here and here. That is the Y distribution. That's this sort of sign or minus sign. Uh, what it calls a minus sign is clustering towards the tips. If you go to a positive sign, it clusters towards the, uh, the, the root, which is not what we would want to do. There's more action going on at the tips, so we're going to cluster towards them. Um, and also, maybe a little tough to see, but um, it's doing a clustering near the leading edge, and the trailing edge have smaller panels than the interior. And that's a cosine distribution. I'm going to up the number of panels from the default 13 to 25 and 25. Um, the expense of the actual calculation method, I think, goes as the square of the number of panels. Um, possibly not a cube, not, but possibly more than a square. So it gets expensive quickly when you up the number of panels. Um, 25 should be sufficient for our project if you were doing something a little bit more like a final design. You'd probably want to play with that until you got until you were sure that the result was not sensitive to those number of panels. 25 is going to be fine for this effort. And now we're done, and I'm going to save and close. So again, I built a one-section wing that had the root cord I wanted, the tip cord I wanted. It didn't have any twists, so I left that zero. 
and I repaneled it, and I built it using 24 twelves, and I repaneled using 25 this way and 25 this way. Um, you can also do other stuff like put foil names on there, but we have NACA 2412 is all is the tip and the root, so that's not very exciting. All right, I'm going to save and close. All right, and so I'm done making my mesh because I only have a main wing. I don't need to define anything else. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is I have my main wing here. I'm going to uh, do an analysis of the main wing. And so I go here. I'm going to do define an analysis. Um, and... I'm also going to do a type 1 here, which is a fixed speed. So for the homework question, we have a particular cruise speed. We have a particular lift coefficient, which we computed about 0.302, I believe it was. So I'm going to put in the right, oops, the right speed, 75 meters per second. Um, the analysis, these are different methods of doing the computation. For this case, I think we're going to use, um, and for the projects, this ring vortex method. And here I have the option of turning viscous on or off. I can make it a fully inviscid calculation, in which case it will only be calculating induced drag. Um, or I can do viscous, in which case it's going to be querying X-foil, as I mentioned, to also include the profile drag. So I'm going to keep that on. Viscous with the VLM2 VLM method. For inertia, I'm going to put the plane mass in here, although I'm thinking this probably doesn't matter, but that's okay. I'm going to put the plane mass in here, 1,400 kilograms. The reference dimensions, this is how it non-dimensionalizes things. Um, we want the projected planform area. This is what we, um, this is uh, the planform area in this case. And that's what we always use for, for non-dimensionalizing our lift and drag. Now for aerodynamic data, I do have something to change here. So it starts off with sea level, looks like sea level values. Um, so I'm going to do, what is it? 0 0.9964 is our density. Um, 964 and the kinematic viscosity was 174. Now the Mac version of XFL R5 has the ability to do a lookup of the standard atmosphere. For some reason I think the Windows version does not have this so just put it in by hand that's fine and then you know you got it right because this is a little more of a black box. Um, extra drag is if you know you have drag coming from other things like the fuselage most importantly you could put this in here and have your analysis include the total drag of everything um, we're, we will add it manually, so we'll leave that alone. And then there's a, a ground effect thing, which you, if someone's interested, you're welcome to ask me about. Um, all right, so we have this. We, now we see the reference area comes out just about where we wanted it to. When I put the root and tip cord in, I truncated the, the floating point a little bit, so we didn't quite get 16.2, but this is fine. And I think that's all we need to do. So the polar type is a type 1, which is going to be a fixed uh, speed. Um, and fixed dynamic pressure. Our analysis is the VLM, VLM, VLM2 and the viscous. Inertia, I did put the mass in here, although this is, um, oh, this will be important because when it computes a lift coefficient, it needs to know what this is. So that's 1,400 kilograms. Um, reference dimensions, uh, don't change anything here. That should be fine. Aerodynamic data, we put in the right density and Kinematic viscosity for altitude of 2,100, I believe, meters. Um, no, I read 1,400 meters. I don't think that's correct. I think the homework is 2,100. I might have to look that up. And extra drag, we ignored. All right, so we're done with this. Now, um, so I say OK. Now I'm going to run the analysis. Sometimes if you accidentally close this window here, you can get it back up here under Options, Restore Toolbars. Um, it took me a while to figure out one time. Okay, so we're done. Now we're going to run an analysis. Now I can run a sequence of alphas, but basically my goal is to come up with the angle of attack that produces the correct lift coefficient. Um, now XFLR5 does not have the ability in this mode to allow you to say, I would like this lift coefficient for the plane, like XFOIL does, where you say, give me this lift coefficient, and it quickly it quickly iterates intelligently through a series of angle of attacks until it converges on the right lift coefficient. Here we have to do that by hand. Now I'm guessing it's going to be around one degree is my guess. Um, again, looking for a lift coefficient of, what was it, 0 0.303. Um, so one degree, I'm going to hit analyze. There it goes. All right, so it ran. Um, let, me, let me get us to where we want, and then I'll talk about what we're seeing in this plot here. Um, there was a window that popped up, and it will pop up again. Um, if you get an error, something about, um, 
that it was unable to do a lookup essentially on the values um, as it's as it's doing the computation of flow over this wing it can figure out the distribution of lift coefficient along here and based on the geometry and the kinematic viscosity and the flight speed you know the Reynolds number so it might grab this section here um, I don't have the ability to put no I do okay so it's again it's divided in little panels so here's a strip right here along this strip represents <coughs> excuse me an airfoil section let's do it out here so it's sort of three two-thirds of the way out that has a certain Reynolds number and um, when it's done computing the, the inviscid flow, it has a certain lift coefficient, which might be a little less than or maybe a little more than the total wing lift coefficient. There'll be some variation of lift coefficient. So each of these little foils, because of the variation in downwash, is seeing a little bit different angle of attack and therefore a little bit different lift coefficient. And because their cords are changing, they have a little bit different Reynolds number. So for each of these, it, once it's done with the inviscid solution, it will come back in and say, okay, the lift coefficient of this thing is, say, it's 0.31, and the Reynolds is 7 million. I don't know what it is. And then it'll go to XFOIL and say, what is, for a lift coefficient of 0.31 and a Reynolds number of 7 million, what is the drag coefficient? And whatever it is, X, uh, the lookup table will tell it, and it'll, it'll apply that to this strip. And then it goes to this one right here, and we'll do the same lookup and the same lookup. CL is varying, Reynolds is varying, so it has to do for each of these strips. It gets each of the drag coefficients for each of the strips. Now some of the strips are smaller, so it has to take into account the area of that strip being less important than these strips here. And then once it's done with that, it can compute a total profile drag coefficient on there um, and add it to the induced drag to get the total drag. So that's why it's a two-step process. First, the inviscid flow then going to its X-foil polar, base polar, to, to query the profile drag. Um, and it doesn't, um, I'm trying to say, it isn't fully coupled in the sense that, it, technically speaking, you have a boundary layer here, and once you went to the X-foil base polar, you could find out what the boundary layers and the boundary layer thickness would change the pressure distribution. Um, but um, we're, not, we're sort of ignoring that. We're taking that into account by assuming that the CL that came out of XFOIL was taking that into account. So it's this two-step process, and if we had selected Inviscid in the solver, it would have been a one-step process. It wouldn't bother with any of this XFOIL lookup business. All right, so then, um, okay, so we're not quite at the right lift coefficient. It's reported down here, um, 0.245, so I need to increase the angle of attack. Let's make it 1.5. Um, and uh, it's solving, and I can see I'm at 0.286, and let me try 0.7, solve, and I'm at 0.302. Okay, it's basically exactly what I wanted for the lift coefficient. Um, happened at an angle of attack, a geometric angle of attack of this wing of 1.7 degrees. Um, and I'm done with that. And now let's have a look at the solution. So I have, um, for example, I'd like to see, what would I like to see? I definitely want to see, let's start with, I'm going to kill these panels, and let's do um, plot the surfaces. And you can do stuff like change the color if you wanted, and you can play around with these kind of things. But let's, we'll leave it green for a second. I want to see where it's transitioning. So I click Trans up here, and I can see the transitions occurring. And again, that came from XFOIL. It just happened to be plotting it on the surface of this foil. The transition is a little bit later towards the tips here. You can see um, the Reynolds number is ranging, so you have a Reynolds number highest here and lowest here, so transition's a little further back down here. Um, the lift coefficient may also be affecting the transition. I think that um, we're going to get a higher lift coefficient towards the root of this um, wing, which means that these sections are at a, effectively at a higher lift coefficient and a higher Reynolds number, which is why the transition's a little earlier. As we get outboard, our Reynolds number is dropping, and I think our lift coefficient is going to be dropping, so it's going to push the transition back. This is the upper surface, lower surface. Transition is actually pretty similar um, to the upper surface transition. A little, no, about the same. And so that's transition. You can also look at the lift distribution here. And again, we were looking for this to be elliptical. It looks fairly elliptical, right, compared to some of the stuff we looked at, we'll look at in class. Um, and it's, um, so our, we have a decent taper ratio, a fairly good elliptical lift, lift distribution. 
Now, it automatically reports for you uh, E, the, the plan form efficiency, 0.996. Um, and so it computes this automatically. We could do this by hand. That would just be equal to CL squared divided by the induced drag times pi times the aspect ratio. And it should report the aspect ratio here. It is reporting it right over here. This is all geometry stuff. Um, and, but it, um, what was I trying to say? Uh, anyway, so it, it reports it for you. So this is E. This is that plan form efficiency that we discussed in class. Not 100%, but close. Um, we can also look at the downwash. So this is the downwash distribution. It shows it on the trailing edge, so you've got to kind of turn the foil around to see it. This is downwash. It isn't quite a straight line. Again, we're looking for constant downwash. We can see that the downwash is a little bit higher at the tips, um, which tells me that maybe the, the tips are, are loaded too high uh, relative to the structure. Maybe if we, if we wash out the tips a little bit or use a higher taper ratio, we might get closer to uh, a, a straight line, but it is not bad. It's only really at the ends that we're not quite getting. The center section looks quite straight to me, so in terms of constant downwash. We can also look at the um, perspective of uh, the span-wise perspective. So this is integrated values along the span. If I double click in here, um, I have a lot of things I can look at. I'm just going to look at a few. One is the local lift coefficient. So this is a local lift coefficient along the span. We can see that the lift coefficient, as it does, go to the zero at the tips. So at the tips, we have um, the condition that the pressure can't jump at the tips. So we have zero um, lift coefficient extending up to a maximum, which actually doesn't quite occur at the root. is a little bit before the root. Um, the whole wing coefficient is 0.3, basically, 303, 0.3. So the whole wing coefficient, so this thing must average to this right here, this dashed line or dotted line. Um, so the outboard sections are below, the inboard sections are above in terms of the lift coefficient. So um, we have higher loading on the inboard, going to zero at the tips, but a fairly elliptical looking uh, distribution. This is a lift coefficient, but elliptical looking distribution. Um, and um, we can also look at, uh, t -t -t uh, I wanted to see Reynolds, yeah, Reynolds number, range, this is geometrical, so we have root, highest Reynolds number, down to the tips, tapering down to the tips, so that's Reynolds number being used for the, for the uh, profile drag, which I think you can also plot, um, total drag, coefficient, local drag, Viscous drag, that's what I want to see, okay. So this is the viscous drag coefficient. This is coming from X-foil, and we can see uh, we have our drag coefficient because the Reynolds number is higher in the middle is a little bit lower, and you get it out to these lower Reynolds, and you have a slightly higher um, drag coefficient. This is not the drag, this is a drag coefficient. So this is being applied to sections. Now these sections are shorter, so even though they have a higher drag coefficient, the actual drag contribution from those um, won't be as much as it is from these center sections. And the last thing that might be of interest, well, is of interest to your project, um, where you're going to have a bending moment um, constraint, is the bending moment. So this shows the bending moment, which goes to zero at the tips. So these are cantilevered uh, structures. And you have a highest bending moment at the root of a cantilever. Um, and here you have these numbers. We can, now we can see what, exactly what those numbers are. Um, by either putting the cursor here or seeing it's about 15,700 newton meters. Um, and we can also get the raw numbers from the data up top. And just want to see if there's anything else I want to mention first. I don't think so. So if we go up here, um, we can go to operating point. So this is this one operating point that gives us our lift coefficient of 0.3. Properties. From my properties, I can get more digits of accuracy in terms of things that I need. So I have here, and particularly these first four numbers are important. The lift coefficient we ended up with, that's the whole plane lift or the whole wing lift coefficient. The entire drag coefficient, 0 0.009, uh, 1, 2, and so this is a, a 91 counts. We have our viscous drag component, and this is, comes from the X foil part. This is viscous pressure drag and skin friction together on the wing, about 52 of those 91, and I have 38 of those 91 coming from the induced drag. The I stands for induced. Induced viscous, total, and lift coefficient. So those are key numbers right here. 
It doesn't report the max bending moment here, which would actually be nice. Um, you can get the real number for this if you'd like it from operating point export, and I can dump all this into a table. Um, I'll just overwrite something I have here. I'm not sure what this is. I'm going to overwrite this text file. Um, hopefully that wasn't important. And I'll go back in and I will open that up so you can see what it looks like. And I think it was right here. Okay. Um, and so I have similar information up here with those drag coefficients induced and uh, the viscous pressure drag or this P stands for profile CD, induced CD, total CD, um, some moments and things you might need. Actually, I'm noticing, which I did not notice before, it does report right here the, the maximum bending moment on the wing. Now, this data file is big. It has all this kind of span-wise variation stuff that it plots in these plots we've been discussing, and it also has all the data, pressure coefficient, um, data for the entire wing for all the cells in the wing if, if you wanted to reconstruct something and I'm not sure there's anything necessary here but the key out of here is this bending moment was about 15,600 Newton meters um, so we'll end that there uh, actually let me just grab um, just check once again these properties and so I'm just going to copy and paste these so I have them um, and I'll need them for, for the homework these here. so this is those are the predictions of uh, XFL R5.